Ah, it's November 7th, 1933. Let's take a look at the news. You see, here in the Soviet Union now, they have a newspaper in English for the over 18,000 American workers just like me. Assalamu alaikum comrades and welcome. Yes, today we're going to be looking at the Moscow news. Started in 1930 by none other than Anna Louise Strong. As you may know, I'm her biggest fan and being the first producer of an English language newspaper was an amazing feat. As I mentioned, over 18,000 American workers, at least on record, worked in the Soviet Union from the late 1920s through the 1930s. Many of them helping in factories, on contract, a lot of different minorities, especially black Americans in the United States, found conditions and acceptance, the very least a little bit better in the Soviet Union, as race did not play a part in what kind of contract work they were able to get. And there were migrant workers from other parts of the world, somewhere over 30,000 of them. And this newspaper was immensely helpful for understanding what was going on in this new place that they at least temporarily called home. I even have this Moscow News newspaper pin. I don't know if you can see it, but it's one of my favorites and I'm going to put it on for this occasion. Not that you can see it from this far away, but it makes me happy and I'm in the mood. So I thought it would be interesting to go through one of my many newspapers. I collect Moscow News from the 1930s, though I have one from the 1940s. I'll take you through the whole thing, or as much as I can. Even just looking at the cover, you can tell it's going to be amazing. I didn't think I'd have to specify this or preface anything in this way, but if the comments on my last video taught me anything, some of you really need to be spoon-fed these preferences. So here you go, open up baby boy. I'm not saying that everything in this newspaper is 100% the way things were every time, all the time, and without bias. That's not how things work. That's not how research works. That's not how reading anything works. As a researcher, you never go into one source, be it primary or otherwise, and assume that this is the absolute truth. Nothing is. I may be selectively giving you publications that are more positive or humanizing to my personal perspective. Hopefully, if you are interested in these topics, you are getting sources from not just me. A newspaper like this, of course, would be catering towards those primarily American foreign workers. And so we can view things through that lens. As they likely viewed it when publishing it, what would an American want to know or hear about what's going on in this country they're currently residing in? You would also get this newspaper sent to you abroad, but I would assume it would get to you a little bit later. It's not any more biased than any local newspaper trying to inform local inhabitants of what's going on, what's changing, what progress is being made, what to get excited about, what successes are happening. Like, of course, it's going to be mentioning positive things that have come and changed in this very rapid growing era of Soviet history. So are you going to find very in-depth critiques of their mistakes? No, of course not, but I wouldn't find that in the local paper of my tiny hometown either. Any self-criticisms or defamations. But there is value in viewing history in the past through the eyes of the foreign American worker reading a newspaper like this. And I hope this is a new perspective that you can value, or at least find amusing at the very least. So let's dig into it. All right, a newspaper like this is quite large, so I'm here on my floor to show you everything that's going on. So here is the cover and in general, it's just absolutely beautiful, I think. The art, everything. Down here, it says philosophers have only interpreted the world differently, but the point is to change it by Karl Marx. So the fact that that's the quote right off the bat on the cover really shows you what you're in for. Up here, you have the new world in the making, a man with a globe and all the different progress being made in the background of this art piece behind him. There's quite a few details when you take a look closely at what's all included here. Um, it's socialism on like a scroll, ships, gears, you got it all. Now moving back up to the header, you got the Moscow Daily News special November 7th edition. Yeah, so November 7th, 1933, editorial offices Moscow, and the price is 10 kopecks. So it's cool that the price is right on there, so you always have that information. But yeah, New World in the Making is just so optimistic. 
So yeah, as you can see, it's quite damaged actually. So I have to be careful here when I turn the page. Um, it's best to handle these things without um, gloves. Trust me on this. Also, if I harm it more, it, it's mine. So it's okay. So the very first article here is a record year for Soviet agriculture. So let's take a closer look into that and read a little bit about what's going on. One of my favorite things about these um, articles and newspapers and collecting this is the fact that there's just unique photographs of everything going on. So here at the beginning it says, The Soviet Union meets the 16th anniversary of the October Revolution with great victories to its credit in agriculture. This year has seen a high yield and big incomes accruing to the collective farms. In every respect, the year has been an exceptional one for agriculture. An unprecedented advance in the countryside followed Stalin's speech at the All Union Conference of Collective Farm Shock Brigaders, when he broadcasted the slogan of making all collective farmers well-to-do. The Communist Party then sent detachments of tried-and-tested Bolsheviks to the countryside, and political departments were organized by them in the machine tractor stations. As you can see, the damage is, is kind of severe here, so I can't read too much more, but I think you can make out some of what's going on. And let's see, honest and industrious collective farmers to rid the collective farms of remnants of yeah, the kulaks. Yep, that's that's what they were talking about in 1933. Moving on. The sp spring sowing was carried out punctually. The harvest of the rich crop has been completed, and after having fulfilled their obligation to the government, the collective farms have already started to distribute the remaining grain among their members. Those collective farmers who worked hard and well will have an income which would have been unthinkable previously under the private holding system. Interesting. Then the article goes on to give examples of this. The next page on the other side is the headquarters of Soviet sport. Sporting would be a big topic in the early Soviet Union, being fit, being important. The State Central Institute of Physical Culture, it is called, 1,000 young Soviet men and women, all crack athletes, interesting term, dated, I'm sure, are being educated here as cultural trainers of Soviet school children, workers, and Red Army men. Stalin once formulated the aims of physical culture, quote, we must bring up the new generation of workers healthy, jovial, capable of raising the might of the Soviet country, and to defend it from attempts on the part of the enemy. And then here on the side of that, we have all these examples of young people in sport, factory girls, Soviet miners, look at these Soviet miners doing some, some stretches. And yeah, these girls, healthy and happy, it says they are. Some Soviet girl athletes waiting for physical culture parade. Now this next page is really cool. I'm really interested in the Red Army page. And next to that is what trade unions mean to the Soviet worker, but eh, not as interesting. So here we have the Red Army. Ready for defense. We do not covet one inch of foreign soil. We will not yield one inch of our own, are the words of Stalin ever present in the minds of Red Army men for an education in political principles of the Soviet state is as much as part of their training as learning to shoot straight. Picture shows Red Army men on parade. Indeed, they look nice. I love their great coats. Of course, they would look much nicer if they had a Budunovka like this lovely man next to them. Oh, I love Budunovka so much. A sturdy lad. <laughs> Indeed he is. Typical of the men who make up this splendid force. The flying flaps of his helmet. Not a helmet. That's a Budunovka. Who wrote this? Are to protect his ears. Oh, sorry about the camera there. Uh, from the severe cold of the Russian winter, the warmest and stoutest possible clothing and boots are given to Red Army men. Yes. God, he looks so cool. I want that coat too. And next we have an airplane. Red Army planes drawn up on Moscow Airdrome, ready for formation flight. As you can see, even more planes behind him there. Next. Oh, look at these guys helping out. Helping the farmers. Red Army men frequently organize Subotniks, days of voluntary labor and emergency. Uh, this group is mending a haying machine on two collective farms. That's so sweet of them. It's cool. It's part of their job. Ooh, another Budanovka. He's looking at some machine here. Let's see. These three photos are all together. Ooh, some tanks. And another thing, something for artillery, I believe. Let's see. I hope the description will inform us here what's going on in all of these 
unique photographs. From a country weak and unprepared for defense, the Soviet Union has become a powerful country fully able to defend itself, ready for all eventualities. The Soviet Union is now able to protect all the modern implements of defense and to supply them to the army in case of an attack from without says Stalin, results of the first five-year plan. I'm assuming that's the speech that this is from. Some of the wording's a bit weird, um, but some of that's just dated ways of saying things. Some of that's me just saying it, not how it's written. <laughs> and on the next page, we have the trade union article. Um, it's quite long, so let me just read the first bit. High on the cliff overlooking the sun-kissed waters of the Black Sea perches a great white building made of concrete and steel and glass in such fashion that it seems to consist entirely of ver verandas and windows. Wherever it was possible for the builders to leave clear space for the sun to shine in, they have left it. Oh, how beautiful. So the next two pages are a little guilt-trippy in their articles. What a Soviet father fought to give his son. Um, that's his son, I'm assuming. And on the other page, Vasilev learns a lesson. Um, the second one being a little bit more interesting, so let me read this one to you because, wow. So first we have this photo, Finnish suits being examined by the plant inspectors. Below Gorichevo, which is this woman you'll see in a bit, her, um, you know, leading these makers of clothing. I'm blanking on the word. I don't see why I need to take an examination on my work, muttered Vasilev, as he slouched down on a rough wooden bench in the corner of the dusty courtyard of the 5th Moscow sewing factory. I've been a tailor for nearly a year, and a good one, too. The boy was speaking to himself, but a little old woman with a straight, with straight gray hair pulled tightly over a wrinkled forehead overheard him and stopped on her way to the factory newsstand. She said, so you know everything about making clothes, my Udarnik? Which is a shock worker. She said in a quiet voice. That age had not robbed of its intensity. The boy winced, for he was the only member of his brigade who had not won an Udarnik book. But it was impossible to be mad at little Gorcheva, the oldest worker in the plant. He chipped the, the caked dust off of the worn heel of his heavy black boot and shook his head. No, little mother, not everything. <laughs> But all I need to know to get by uh, on my bench. How long have you been here? Asked the old worker, standing directly in front of the lounging boy and drawing up to her full five feet two inches. Dressed in a crimson rayon sweater, cotton dress, and sneakers of the same shade, Gorcheva seemed to Vasilev, Vasilev? I forget how to say his name, uh, a spirit from the banners on the red corner come to life. Wow. It gets even better, trust me. Since the start of the second five-year plan, he stammered, I left our village to work here. Do you think the work is hard? she asked. Of course it's hard. 2,500 workers can't turn 2,100 complete men's suits and 2,100 spare pairs of men's pants every day without hustling. Osipova, come here a minute, called the veteran to a ruddy cheeked young woman in a patched black cotton dress whose coat of tan did not hide the lines stamped by a hard, ill-nourished childhood Oof, on a prematurely old face. It's, it's a bit harsh. Here's a fellow who thinks he works too hard. Tell him about the days when you first came to the factory. Asapova plunged a pair of calloused hands into the deep pockets of her dress and grinned came to work in 1915. Oh, they're gonna teach him a history lesson. I love this so much. I started working in this plant back in 1915. It wasn't a factory then, just a sweatshop. Twelve years and two months old I was when my brother took me across this very courtyard to ask for a job. There wasn't any newsstand here then. Right where that volleyball court is now, there stood a one-story wooden office building. That's where I was hired, in a little room in the back, full of cheap pictures and tobacco smoke. <laughs> Even now, I never smell a cigar without thinking of the office. Well, at least you didn't have to fulfill a plan, did you? asked Vasilev. He had stopped kicking the dust and was uh, staring at the face of the girl. It had never occurred to him that some of his fellow workers might have been in the plant before the revolution. Plan? I should say not. The only plan was to get as much work out of us as possible. I think you're seeing how this is a guilt-trippy story, huh? 
12 hours a day was the regular schedule for apprentices, and we often had to make deliveries of rush orders after working hours. Many a night I slept in the washroom because I was too tired to go home. Eight in the morning till eight at night, and the pay was five rubles a month. We worked that way for three years and then got a regular job, if we were lucky. <laughs> the sea love's mouth and eyes opened wider. More than 12 hours a day, he said. How could you stand? We couldn't. By Christmas of 1915, conditions had become impossible. We struck for a 10% raise in a shorter working day. The whole factory walked out. Do you remember, Gorcheva? How could I forget <laughs> when I did the picket duty every day for a week and a half? My, but it was cold. Did you get the raise? One strike they won is the next part of this. I just love the story so much. You really need to hear this. It's great. Not that time. After 10 days, they fired the leaders. They could have filled the job three times over from the applicants, but there was one strike we workers did not lose. The revolution. It seems only yesterday that we heard that Nicholas II was abdicated and we stopped work and took up a collection. We used that money to buy a great red flag and marched with it down Nikolskaya to join the demonstration that swept over the city. The most exciting of all was the cold morning in October when a member of the factory cell met us at the gate with the news that the Bolsheviks had seized the power in St. Petersburg. We didn't go to work that day. No, not till after a week of fighting and the great funeral for 480 comrades. When we did come back, it was our own factory. Isn't that just like an amazing story in this whole lesson they're trying to teach this kid? You know, I also think that this story is pretty relevant to today with how we're seeing so many labor unions form and, and strikes form, especially in companies like Starbucks. Now, the next page is a little problematic from Stone Age to socialism in 16 years. Um, here's an example of how the Soviet Union didn't do everything great. Um, in my opinion, one of the one of the places where they didn't do uh, too well is in regards to proper ethnographic investigation and research and really getting to know all of the different kinds of people. Um, the way that they sometimes describe some of the peoples, especially in the far, far north and far, far east, uh, isn't, isn't great. I mean, sure, it's the 1930s in the US, they weren't great with it either, but still, uh, you know, we can expect better from a growing progressive region and I'm not yeah I don't even want to read this to be honest they basically call these people's culture and way of life prehistoric and yeah you can pause and read if you really want to endure that next is a full page on socialist realism here and he just looks so tired and over it but let's leave that man alone and go on to the next page the soviet policy of peace and centered here, we have the People's Commissar of Foreign Affairs, M.M. Litvinov. Nice. And over on the next page, we have up here the Moscow Daily News logo. Let me show you that. It's such a classic font for a newspaper, but as you can see, editor-in-chief Borodin, who took over for Anna Louise Strong right there. And under the banner of Leninism is the title of this giant article, which... Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm not going to read. We don't have time to go over everything, so I just picked a few things to read. And let's move on to the next page because I screamed when I saw it. And I hope you're going to scream too. And here we go. Look at these portraits of Lenin and Stalin. Just wow. Something interesting about newspapers like this is they often included portraits of like Lenin or Stalin and then you could cut them out and put them in a frame and put them on their wall. Most notably here though is the artist, as I'm pointing out, Victor Denny. Victor Denny is renowned as one of the best and most iconic poster artists out of the Soviet Union. You may have seen this piece of Lenin sweeping the world, um, his depictions of the bourgeois as spiders and just many of these victory pictures during the war, and of course credited for making <laughs> the Chad meme. And here I am now in possession of some of his original pieces, and just look at that nose on Stalin, it's so good. I love these pieces, and it's a, his iconic signature, undoubtedly his, um, and then also translated into English if you can't read his handwriting, I guess, but look at these two. Yeah, I'm just 
I'm in love with these two pages and the fact that I am in possession of them uh, blows my mind because it's kind of a big deal to own something by this artist and I didn't even know these were in here when I got the newspaper. This particular style in drawing of Stalin gives me some Borat vibes but like in the best way possible like he looks hot he's got a great nose and uh I don't know I kind of like Borat so anyways moving on to the next two pages we have the Bolsheviks conquer the stratosphere and USSR's achievements in education we also got on the other side a little more interesting the role of foreign workers and specialists in socialist construction along with these three examples and photographs of the foreign workers that they're going to talk about in this article. So during the first five-year plan, the Soviet Union's great program of socialist construction enrolled thousands of workers and specialists from foreign lands. The second five-year plan, with its slogan, to master the new factories and master technique, has offered the foreign worker and specialist an adequate and inspiring opportunity to join in work for which he is well fitted, since he, becomes, since he comes equipped with high technical knowledge and experience. Those foreigners who have not treated their jobs in a formal manner, uh, who have been willing not only to work but to struggle, already see the fruits of their labor. So that's pretty neat there. They also just mentioned that, yeah, we're bringing in skilled foreign workers because they they know a lot, things that we're trying to learn and improve on now. And moving on to the next two pages, we have another big article on Soviet art. We have a lot to say about it. I mean, I'm not surprised in the 20s and 30s, the art scene was booming. And on the page next to that is how new men were made at Stalingrad um, in reference to the Stalingrad uh, tractor plant. And one interesting excerpt from that would be, buy clothes and books. The fellows began to buy new suits, watches, and books. Severals made a point of buying a new book each payday. Soon they built up libraries of their own. They began to come to work looking clean and tidy, and nobody laughed at them for this, as they would have done before. As we developed, so did the plant. Eight months after that decisive April, when some, some individual came, we were turning out 125 tractors a day. Today we have a factory kitchen, and a circus, a club, a cinema, and a sports stadium. In 1930 we spent our time in the smoke-filled room of the Komsomol secretary, where we sat on the bed and on the floor. Those who acted the ruffian and broke the windows then now go to the talkies and play volleyball. So that's cool how they're just showing how things have improved at the tractor plant. Moving on to the next two pages, we have the Academy of Science in the Service of Socialist construction. I really love the images on this page especially. Look at that. So, young American scientists work in Leningrad. The group of scientific institutes located in the northern part of Leningrad counts a number of foreign foreigners among its research workers. In the Electrophysical Institute, with its powerful lightning generator, a young American, Evert Ostland, is working on a new type of mercury arc rectifier for converting an alternating current into direct current. Hmm, interesting. And then we have the struggle to conquer the atom. Professor Sokolov, originator of a new method of studying the atom as described in this article, is a graduate of Moscow University. He was commissioned by the Committee for the Aid of Scientists of the Council of People's Commissars to carry out research on the atom. At present, he is engaged in research work at the Moscow Oil Institute. Ooh, important man. And here they are, conquering the atom. Oh, I really like this. Yes, that, there's Professor Sokolov Sokolov. I'm so sorry about my pronunciation. Um, obviously, Russian isn't my native language, and I'm always putting the emphasis on the incredibly wrong part, but hey, let's move on. So this next page is really interesting because we have a handy reference price list, um, which is absolutely handy for people and historians and researchers in the future when we're trying to reference how much things cost and what was available to people. And as you can see, so many things are on this list. Chocolate sweets, caramels, 
sugar, meat, men's underwear, blouses, knit shawls, women's cotton costumes, um, child shoes, you know, just look at this list and it tells you the price of course various goods gramophone clocks yeah perfumes everything you need really and so yeah it's just cool to reference especially when people are like they didn't have access to anything in the soviet union well here's a giant list of like many many things and on the page next to it is this advertisement for for bonds i'll be honest i know like nothing about any of that so if, if someone could inform me down below what this means i always see advertisements um for bonds and i've just not looked it up so if you can tell me a little bit about that down below i'd really appreciate it i'm always up for learning i'm just uh, being a little lazy right now and the next page the tale of two cities those two cities being moscow and leningrad we also have this nice photograph of red square in winter in moscow cute and over on this next page we have one of my favorite parts of any newspaper or magazine and that is the old advertisements the first one really sticking out to me is ussr in construction because it is one of the most collectible and expensive magazines to get these days because as the name suggests it's quite in a constructivist style and so people who collect art rare art, constructivist art, whether or not it has to do with the Soviet Union, um, buy this magazine. And so, yeah, it's like anywhere from 70 to like $500. It's impossible. So I don't have any of them, but I love seeing these old advertisements for it. So yeah, a monthly pictorial magazine in various languages, artistically illustrated. And look, it was only $4 a year back in the day. And then we have this general subscription for all newspapers and magazines published in the USSR interesting would have loved to sign up for that and then the subscription to continuing the moscow daily news um, always pages of pictures sound facts editorial comment feature article stories theater book reviews and look they have all of the addresses for like the offices and six months four dollars not bad ah uh, soviet travel the handsome all-inclusive illustrated bi-monthly paper magazine i don't even know this one but yeah there's a lot of options here. It's really cool to see, but it also makes me sad because I'm paying way more for these pieces of paper. And now we're going to the very last page, the back of this newspaper, and it's the triumphs of the year. I absolutely love this. So let's take a closer look and see what those triumphs were for 1933. So here's a closer look of the picture. You have a man meeting with a bunch of children and women. It says, the chief of the political section of the machine tractor station pays a visit to the collective farm nursery. The successful work of the political sections in agriculture was an outstanding feature of 1933. Then we have this lady enjoying some wheat, perhaps a rich harvest was one of the results of the better agricultural methods introduced under the guidance of the political sections. Then over here, we have Soviet technique passed a grueling test in the Moscow Karakum run in which 23 Soviet automobiles traveled 9,500 kilometers over roads of which one uh, like the above was by no means the worst. I mean, it doesn't look, well, it looks kind of fun actually. Cars and equipment came through the test with flying colors. They did this often as like a celebration to have races for like factory workers. It was like a fun thing that they did in the 30s a lot. Now this one you may have heard of because it was kind of like a big deal. The Stratostat. Ascent of Prokoitev? Don't know, sorry. Burnham and Gudunov in the USSR to a height of 60,000 feet was another proof of Soviet mastery of technique. The greatest height yet reached by man was achieved with the world's largest balloon. Yeah, so may maybe you've heard of this one, but like going like the highest amount so far in like the largest air balloon, it's kind of a big deal, kind of impressive. Scary though. And then we have the Baltic White Sea Canal was finished during the year, opening the gates of the third sluice to make way for a vessel. It's a pretty cool picture. Look how tiny the guys are on top of that. 
and Chelyabinsk tractor plant was opened in the summer and is proceeding smoothly towards capacity production of 60,000 Caterpillar tractors. Wow, interesting. Um, some interesting fact about Chelyabinsk, the region, is that half of it's in European Russia and half of it's in technically what is considered Siberia. So fun Chelyabinsk fact. And then let's have a close-up of this corner over here, published in the USSR. How cool is that? Yeah, so that was every page of this newspaper. What do you think? What did you learn? Isn't it cool? Are you as excited about these things as I am? I hope so. So only after filming all of that did I go back and listen to my videos and I realized the audio was worse this time than last time. Some of you were complaining about my microphone, so I thought I would try my lav mic. Uh, it's worse and I don't want to refilm all of that, so I'm very, very sorry. But I am going to um, purchase a better, more expensive mic in the future, inshallah. Um, and to help me do that, you can potentially um, join my Patreon. I do have a Patreon if you're willing to support me uh, monthly. That is an option for you and if you want to put down a one-time donation to support my work and what I do and then potentially yeah, have better audio. I do have a PayPal linked below where you can send a one-time donation and I just reopened my shop. I have a shop that sells um, stickers and prints of various Soviet propaganda, art that I particularly find helpful and humanizing, most of that being about the Soviet republics, the multinationality celebratory poster art. And the print I currently have up is a poster that dedicated towards the Muslims of the Soviet Union from the 1920s. It's a really cool one. I have it on my own wall as well. So those are all options to help financially support the work that I do here. And I'd greatly appreciate it if you check out the links below. If you find what I do helpful or meaningful or worth supporting in any way, please don't be too angry about the audio. Um, I did my best to salvage what I had. And yeah, I'll try to improve in the future, comrades. So please be inspired by history. And thank you so much for spending the time to watch what I had to say here.